The world thought he was finished. The great Napoleon, crushed, sentenced to life in exile. The Allied forces of Europe thought they'd seen the last of him, but they were wrong. In barely a hundred days, Napoleon will break free from exile, march to Paris, marshal an army, and take on the entire continent at Waterloo. One last campaign to reclaim his empire or surrender forever. In his darkest hour, a conqueror's resurrection begins with his destruction. April 12th, 1814. The man who had all of Europe at his feet is about to have his empire ripped from his grasp. Napoleon Bonaparte once terrorized the entire continent. Now he faces a terror of his own humiliation of defeat. Yesterday, his enemies, the Allies, Britain, Russia, Prussia, and Austria, forced him to surrender his crown. Napoleon's ambition had cost France close to a million men. With the stroke of a quill, it's over. His empire had devoured land from Moscow to Egypt. Now it's gone, leaving France a shadow of her former glory. The emperor faces a grim future. His enemies have stormed the gates of Paris and condemned him to life in exile. <laughs> Terrified of what lies ahead and haunted by the past, Bonaparte calls it quits. downs a heavy dose of poison. After two decades of conquest, Napoleon is giving up. Napoleon clearly feels that the game is up. All the hopes that he's trying to wriggle out of this desperate situation, he suddenly finds that there's nothing else to do. He wanted to go out in a blaze of glory, and if he couldn't do it by winning, he wanted to do it by dying as gloriously as possible while he was still emperor. Napoleon's determination propelled him from the hills of Corsica to the streets of the French Revolution, from the battlefields of Russia, to the throne of a French empire that rivaled ancient Rome. When Napoleon was just 23 years old, he was still unknown. Four years later, he was the greatest general France had seen in centuries. Two years after that, he was the ruler of France. Six years after that, he ruled the largest empire that Europe had seen, probably since the Romans. Napoleon was traumatized by the thought that with this signature, it was all going to end in a twinkling. His imperial dream snuffed out Napoleon is determined to die with it. But the poison doesn't work. He begs his doctor for a heavier fatal dose, but the doctor refuses to finish him off. I am not an assassin. Empereur! Empereur! Napoleon 
had gambled his empire and lost it all. But the emperor is far from finished. While Napoleon laments his past, the Allies plot his future. They draft the Treaty of Fontainebleau, dictating the terms of his abdication and his sentence to exile. But the Allies still face a dilemma. Where do you cage a tiger? They decide on a little island called Elba, just six miles off the coast of Italy. Allies even allow Napoleon to keep an imperial title, Emperor of Elba. Elba had the advantage of being an island, um, easily controlled, easily patrolled. Well, before Napoleon's arrival, Elba is a pretty small backwater. He was still allowed to keep his title of emperor. He was allowed to have a, an allowance from the French government of two million francs a year. Napoleon is too big a character to live on such a tiny place. It's like you've been managing a company and then you're asked to be the janitor. But many of the delegates fear that Elba is too close to Europe to keep such a dangerous force bottled up for long. Getting to Elba means surviving a journey through a hostile land, France. The country is full of people who now despise him and he knows how dangerous angry crowds can be from experience 22 years before. August 1792, the revolution. King Louis XVI was under attack as the French took to the streets of Paris calling for democracy. At 23, Napoleon was swept up in the tide. On August 10th, a mob marched on the Tuileries Palace to confront the king. Napoleon had a front row view. What he saw would scar him forever. The mob slaughtered the king's guards, tearing their corpses to pieces. Napoleon said it was worse than any battlefield he had seen. It was carnage. Napoleon was absolutely horrified by this. He was someone who had a great deal of enthusiasm for the revolution. But when he saw this bloodshed, it simply confirmed in him a disdain, a contempt for the crowd. Three years later, Napoleon's contempt for mob rule catapulted him to the front ranks of the revolution. October 5th, 1795. A mob of the king's supporters marched on the revolutionary parliament. Napoleon received orders to stop the attack and seized the moment to make his mark. In the late summer of 1795, there were royalist protesters in Paris who wanted to overthrow the government. And the government called out the, the standing army. This was the first time in the history of the French Revolution that the army had been called out to suppress the, the crowds. The mob approached swelling to more than 20,000. Napoleon ordered his cannon loaded not with cannonballs, but with grape shot, small pellets, to hit more bodies with every blast. They dragged the cannons up to a church in central Paris called Saint-Roch, not far from the Tuileries Palace, and as the royalists streamed down towards this church, Napoleon famously shouts, fire. The crowd was mowed down en masse. It was just massive carnage, blood and death, and the crowd realized in one swoop, this was not crowd control like they'd ever known. Napoleon would later boast that he cleared the streets of Paris with a whiff of grape shot. His reward was a promotion to Major General. He had made his mark by soaking the streets of Paris with French blood. 
just a hint of the horrors to come. Nineteen years later, Napoleon confronts his own horror. Having failed to kill himself, he faces a bleak future of exile. Since death is no more willing to take me in bed than on the battlefield, I shall go on. A British colonel, Neil Campbell, is to escort Napoleon to Elba and spy on him in exile. When Campbell arrives at Fontainebleau, he finds the ex-emperor a nervous wreck. Napoleon agonizes over his defeat. He paces constantly, chewing his knuckles raw. Napoleon certainly had reason to fear assassination, and by 1814, he was really hated by a lot of the French. France was filled with, at this point, a great number of royalists who loathed and hated Napoleon and would have been happy to kill him. And so there was good reason to think that he could have been assassinated. On his last day at Fontainebleau, Napoleon bids farewell to his most loyal troops, the famous French Imperial Guard. I have sacrificed all my rights, and I'm ready to sacrifice myself, for all my life has been devoted to the happiness and glory of France. With a last cry, long live the Emperor, Napoleon Bonaparte begins the dreaded journey into exile. The road south carries him deep into a hostile world. If he has any hope of winning back his people, he will have to survive them first. People were very angry with Napoleon because he had been promising them victories. He had been promising them one more effort and the empire will be established. And they had again and again provided armies with a kind of loyalty that no other general had enjoyed in modern history. And then it ended in a catastrophe. There are large parts of France that are unhappy with the way the regime has ended, and, uh, and they want him to suffer for it. At Moulins, royalists swarm the carriage, shouting, long live the king. Napoleon orders the driver to pick up the pace. At Orgon, an effigy of Napoleon hangs from a makeshift gallows. Its sign threatens, sooner or later, this will be the tyrant's fate. Terrified, Napoleon disguises himself as a courier. It's a humiliation he hasn't felt since he first came to France as a child, 35 years before. April 23rd, 1779. A nine-year-old boy arrived from Corsica to study at the elite French military school in Brienne. But young Napoleone Bonaparte could barely speak French. His classmates were merciless. They ridiculed his Italian accent and backward country manners. Napoleon was an exotic for them. He was an oddity. He came from Corsica. He spoke French with a heavy accent. He's only recently just learned French, really. And they make fun of him. They make his name sound like a piece of straw on your nose. Instead of Napoleon, it sounds like Napoleon, which means in French, you've got a piece of straw on your nose. The Corsican boy grew bitter. He called his classmates hereditary asses, the scourge of the nation. He declared, I shall do these French all the harm I can. Napoleon graduated in 1784 and entered the Ecole Royale Militaire. He soon became a French patriot and would bring both harm and glory to the French people he once reviled. Thirty years later, 
Napoleon takes his last steps on his beloved French soil. Fearful of assassination, he sails for Elba in the safety of a British vessel rather than a French ship. He boards the HMS Undaunted and requests a 21-gun salute as Emperor of the Island of Elba. As Napoleon is shipped off into exile, his enemies gather to toast the tyrant's defeat. The Allies, Britain, Russia, Prussia, and Austria plot the course of France's future. Amidst the world-class schemers, one Machiavellian icon stands alone, Napoleon's longtime advisor, Charles Maurice Talleyrand. Talleyrand served six regimes and betrayed four. He is among your most talented and bright, but most duplicitous characters of all in the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic period. Talleyrand is one of the incredible characters of this period. He was born into a, a great French noble family. He embraced the revolution and then managed to stay active in almost every regime that followed for the next 30 years. With Napoleon gone, Talleyrand switches sides to the Allies and weasels his way back to power. But a cloud of doubt hangs over the proceedings. Is Elba really far enough away? One official comments that putting Napoleon on Elba is like having Vesuvius next door to Naples. When would the explosion occur? When would those seven miles be crossed? When would Napoleon come back? It was just a matter of time. An island prison would prove no match for a force as powerful as Napoleon Bonaparte. May 1814. The British frigate the Undaunted arrives at the island of Elba and discharges its precious cargo. The island's new emperor, Napoleon Bonaparte. Only six miles from the Italian coast, this speck of land is where Napoleon will be confined for now. A welcoming committee whisks Napoleon to his new imperial capital, the village of Porto Ferraio. Town Hall has been converted into an improvised palace. The Emperor's new throne is an old threadbare sofa. The rest of his island is a disease-ridden rock only 17 miles long. With a population of 12,000, mostly peasants, it's a feeble substitute for the empire he created and ruled for 15 years. From the moment Napoleon set foot on Elba, he was thinking how he could recommence his fabulous destiny. Well, when Napoleon got to Elba, clearly he was thinking about ways to return to France. He was not somebody who was ready to settle down in retirement in a place like Elba, not yet. But while Napoleon takes stock of his new home, someone else is getting comfortable in his old one. Tuileries Palace in Paris. Napoleon's old co-conspirator Talleyrand has made himself kingmaker. And the man he props up on the throne is the brother of the deceased Louis XVI. Louis XVIII weighs in as the latest Bourbon king of France. But his 300-pound figure hardly inspires enthusiasm in the people. Louis XVIII was fat, he was gouty. There were all sorts of rumors about his impotence. He was not a charismatic figure in the least, and 
nobody can be very charismatic in comparison with Napoleon. Louis inherits a shattered economy, decimated by Napoleon's wars. He slashes the army's budget, throwing a quarter of a million soldiers out of work. As an insult, he stiffs Napoleon, refusing to pay his pension. Obviously, among the people still loyal to Napoleon, particularly in the army, this did not go over well at all. Bankrupt, Napoleon chafes in his island prison. Exile is unacceptable, especially for a man who's worked miracles since he first led men to war 18 years before. March 1796. After Napoleon's triumphant whiff of grape shot, one French official warns, promote this man or he will promote himself. At 26 years old, Bonaparte was a major general with a thankless mission, the endless campaign against Austria for control of northern Italy. The young general took command of an army of some 40,000 hungry and ill-equipped men. When Napoleon took over the Army of Italy in 1796, it was in desperate shape. The men did not have enough to eat, their uniforms were in tatters. Above all, they didn't have the boots to march. One of his famous declarations is, you are poorly fed, you are poorly dressed, and you've got no food, but we're going to win anyway. Napoleon taught his men to live off the land. He camped with them, ate with them, and won their undying devotion. Napoleon was a psychologist, a psychologist of his men. At the moments of greatest pain and likeliest defeat, he was able to win superhuman amounts of suffering and devotion. But Bonaparte's obsession was speed. He raced his troops across the Alps, marching into battle at a pace his enemies never anticipated. Napoleon moves faster and thinks faster than everybody else. His standard military credo is to make sure that I have more troops at any specific moment than the opponent. He always knows when is just the right moment to launch the attack. In April 1796, Napoleon's troops stormed into northern Italy. In less than two weeks, he ended a war that had dragged on for years. He then took the battle to the Austrians. In the border town of Lodi, he marched his troops over a bridge and straight into the Austrian guns. His men charged into a death trap. But French cavalry swooped in on the Austrians, handing the lucky General Bonaparte a surprise victory. It wasn't any great battle. In fact, it was a bit of a mess. It wasn't a particularly great performance by Napoleon or by his army, but he won the battle and started to establish the legend. Napoleon is a great publicist. He is the master of spin. Throughout the whole of the Italian campaign, he's publishing his own newspapers, which say things like, floats like a butterfly, stings like a bee. This is the kind of thing he's printing in his own newspapers about himself. Over time, Napoleon transformed the near disaster at Lodi into an act of battlefield brilliance. His Italian triumph made him the most popular and powerful soldier in France. The results of the first Italian campaign for Napoleon were extraordinary. French generals had been trying to conquer northern Italy for centuries, and none of them had succeeded. Napoleon not only succeeded, but seemed to do so almost effortlessly. He did what nobody else had done previously. That was enough to establish him as the most important general in France. But the hero's public confidence evaporated in private. He could redraw the boundaries of Europe, but there was still one thing he couldn't control, his wife. Just two days before marching off to Italy, Napoleon had married a woman six years his senior, Josephine de Beauharnais. Josephine de Beauharnais was a very unlikely wife for Napoleon. 
She was older than he was. She was a Creole, originally from the island of Martinique in the Caribbean. She had been widowed when her husband was sent to the guillotine in the revolution. Napoleon is obsessed with Josephine. He's completely bowled over by her, as we see from the early letters, these extraordinary, passionate letters that he writes day after day. The lovesick general poured out his passion in daily letters from the battlefront. Josephine sent almost nothing in response. Her silence drove him to the brink of madness. I shall go berserk if I do not have a letter from you tomorrow. Never has destiny resisted my will. Napoleon insisted on constant displays of love from Josephine. There's a, one of the letters where he talks about, if you don't write back to me one of these days, I shall burst back in and I shall fly through the window and stab you with my little sword. And you think, little sword? So it is his little sword. So I think there's a metaphor for his little sword. I don't think it's a real sword that he's actually wielding there. The anxious young general would eventually turn his back on love and channel all his passion into what he knew, warfare. Now, 18 years later, in the summer of 1814, Napoleon summons up his energy for a new campaign. Life in a cage trapped on a Mediterranean backwater will never satisfy his ambition. He had been the master of all of Europe, everywhere from Portugal to Moscow. And to stuff him on an island that is 16 miles long and its widest seven miles with 12,000 inhabitants just wasn't going to do. When you are on a small island, once you have set in motion the machinery of civilization, there is nothing left to do but perish from the boredom or to get away from it by some heroic venture. Napoleon Bonaparte is about to launch an attack that will shake all of Europe. February 1815. Napoleon Bonaparte has been caged on Elba for 10 months. But even in exile, ambition dies hard, and he gives his island prison an imperial makeover. Napoleon took the job of government seriously and Elba was another chance to modernize. And I think then he ran out of things to do. Life in Elba begins to mimic Parisian society. Tourists flock to the island, eager for a glimpse of Europe's caged eagle. Napoleon probes his visitors for information. What's the political climate in France? How would he be received if he returned? He keeps up the run of Elba social life. He keeps the kingdom of Elba running. And at the same time, he is in contact with Bonapartist supporters in France. Elba was not at the far end of the planet. It was easy for him to have news of Europe, of the continent of France. Napoleon was well aware of what was taking place in France and in Vienna. While the Allies redraw the map of France, Napoleon plots an escape from Elba and a campaign to reclaim his throne. The plan requires total secrecy. Elba's token military comes complete with a warship, the Inconstant. Disguised as a British naval vessel, it'll make the perfect vehicle for his escape. Napoleon prepares to unleash his great weapons, speed and surprise, to re-establish his empire. His quest is a long shot, but not for a man who dreamed of ruling the entire world and almost pulled it off. May 1798, young General Bonaparte dreamed of conquest. His global ambition found an ally, Talleyrand. The devious foreign minister suggested he begin with Egypt. The British dominated world trade. To destroy their monopoly, 
Talleyrand convinced Napoleon to cut off their supply routes in Cairo. On May 19th, Napoleon set sail with more than 35,000 men. July 1st, his invasion force landed near Alexandria and began to march over 130 miles to Cairo. But the Mamelukes who ruled over Egypt weren't about to surrender. They rallied their forces and prepared to repel the French invaders. On July 21st, with the pyramids on the horizon, Napoleon deployed his troops in square formations, all guns pointed outward. The Mamelukes flew over the dunes on horseback, but their sharp scimitars were no match for the French guns. The French adopt the square tactics, and the attackers, of course, don't have firearms particularly. They're very good horsemen, but they can't really resist the carbines of the French army and, uh, and are mown down. At the Battle of the Pyramids, Napoleon lost barely 30 men. Thousands of Mamelukes lay dead. Napoleon had won France a new colony, but his triumph soon became a trap. Disease, heat, and homesickness drove many of the soldiers to suicide. Attacks from insurgents wore them down. Then they encountered an even deadlier enemy, the bubonic plague. What Napoleon found in Egypt was a horror show in terms of the state of development, the weather, the degree of enmity from the locals. He hadn't been prepared for that much warfare under those terrible conditions. Fortunately, news of trouble back home helped Napoleon escape his Egyptian quagmire. A European coalition had mobilized to invade France. On August 23rd, Napoleon abandoned his army and set sail for home. Napoleon left Egypt in 1799, and it looks very much like somebody deserting his post. It seemed for a while that the French Republic was on the brink of collapse. Napoleon uh, was desperate to get back to France. Um, he also felt that the moment had clearly come when he had to get back into the game of French politics. Egypt had become a nightmare, but Napoleon used his PR genius to spin it into a triumph. His patriotic conquest, the land of the pharaohs. When Napoleon got back to France in 1799, people didn't yet think of the Egyptian campaign as a disaster. France was still ruling Egypt, they'd conquered it, and Napoleon was still widely regarded as the great hero who had conquered this colony for France. On his return to Paris, the victor of Egypt found the government in chaos. The two legislative bodies, the Council of Elders and the Council of 500, were deadlocked. The conflict meant opportunity for a pair of ambitious conspirators, Talleyrand and the conniving politician Joseph Siez. Siez wanted to control the government. He planned to use Napoleon for political muscle, a stepping stone to power. Napoleon knew very well that after the coup, he would be the one who would be able to call the shots. He was the one who had the loyalty of the army. He was the one who also had the great reputation among the people. CS had neither of these things. On November 10th, Napoleon made his move. He barged into the Council of Elders and delivered an incendiary speech. You are sitting on a volcano. The elders shouted him down, calling him a dictator. But Napoleon wasn't finished. He stormed off to the Council of 500. Napoleon marched in with four grenadiers. That was illegal. It was against any constitutional right that a military commander with troops would enter the houses of government. It just didn't happen, and it shouldn't happen. Napoleon's entrance provoked a near riot. In the pandemonium, he scratched his face raw before the guards rescued him. For once in Napoleon's life, he was quite unsure of himself. He blustered, he faltered, he essentially ran out. Then another Bonaparte stepped in, Napoleon's brother Lucien. 
As Napoleon stood dazed, his brother rallied the troops. Lucien declared that British spies had infiltrated the council and attacked Napoleon. He then drew his sword and pointed it at his brother's heart. You have a brother act, a one-two punch coming from Lucien and Napoleon Bonaparte. Lucien goes up to Napoleon, draws his sword, and said, if I thought this man, my own brother, were going to destroy the revolution and the Constitution, I would slay him myself. Troops stormed into the council hall and declared a takeover. The councilmen scrambled to escape. Those who remained were forced to sign on to a new government headed by three consuls. But with First Consul Bonaparte running the show. Napoleon, a 30-year-old general, was officially the government of France, the embodiment of the will of the French people. Fifteen years later, trapped in exile, Napoleon again feels the national will calling him home. He drafts a speech to announce his glorious return to France. Frenchmen, in my exile, your complaints and your desires have reached me. You have asked for the government of your choice. The eagle will fly from village spire to village spire, even to the towers of Notre Dame. The Imperial Eagle is about to take flight. February 26, 1815. The most dangerous prisoner in Europe is about to stage a breakout. Napoleon Bonaparte is escaping from Elba. Accompanied by a contingent of Imperial Guards, Napoleon boards the ship the Inconstant and sails for home. A prisoner of his own ambition, Napoleon wants his empire back. empire he imposed on the world when he crowned himself emperor ten years before. After seizing power as first consul, Napoleon quickly stabilized the country, stamping out the spasms of violence that had rocked France since the revolution. What Napoleon accomplished as first consul was really very considerable. He imposed order and he set up the basis of a durable government. Napoleon snuffed out critics and opponents of his new regime with harsh justice. The repression sparked growing resentment. And one band of angry citizens vowed to make the new First Consul feel their hatred. Christmas Eve, 1800. Napoleon headed to the opera for a performance of Haydn's creation. Ahead, on a corner of Rue saint Niquez, an ordinary wagon loaded with everyday barrels, except one packed with explosives. Napoleon, always in a rush, flew by. A split second later, the bomb went off. The explosion killed eight people and wounded dozens. But Napoleon wasn't among the casualties. He actually went to the opera and put in an appearance there, and when news spread, that he had almost been assassinated. Uh, the spectators simply rose, rose up and cheered him. The attempt on his life gave First Consul Bonaparte an excuse to crack down even harder and cement his grip on power. Thereafter, people ask the question, what happens if Napoleon dies? And so Napoleon encourages the debate as to what happens to the state if he's not there. Napoleon called for a national referendum. By a vote of over 3 million to 8,000, he was elected first consul for life. But even lifetime dictatorship couldn't satisfy his ambitions. Well, Napoleon is eventually convinced that in order to establish a really durable regime, and in order to be accepted by the rest of Europe, he has to be a monarch. Napoleon proclaimed the birth of a new empire, 
power base beyond any king or queen, a realm with a new Caesar at its head, Emperor Bonaparte. To declare yourself emperor was in no way the same thing as making yourself king. In making himself emperor, Napoleon and his contemporaries did not see himself as becoming a monarch in the old regime sense of the term. He was occupying a Roman position that had all the glory that attached to Roman history. On December 2nd, 1804, Napoleon's family, his court, and the Pope himself gathered in the darkness of Notre Dame Cathedral. Napoleon Bonaparte, a 35-year-old Corsican upstart, raised a crown of golden laurels and placed it on his own head. And he staged this incredible, grandiose coronation ceremony for himself, but also to get the Pope there, to get the Pope in his presence so that Napoleon would be accepted as legitimate by Catholics both inside of France and outside. I wanted to rule the world, and in order to do this, I needed unlimited power. The world begged me to govern it. Sovereigns and nations vied with one another in throwing themselves under my scepter. In a single moment, Napoleon served the world notice. His ambition knew no limits. His empire would have no boundaries. The benefits of the coronation, in terms of the effect it had on Europe, the, the other monarchs, uh, the fact that the Pope came to Paris and performed this ceremony was spellbinding. To prove himself worthy, the self-proclaimed emperor needed a battle that would make history. One year later, he got the perfect opportunity. October 1805, Napoleon's old enemy, Austria, was on the offensive. The Austrians wanted to keep the upstart empire out of northern Italy. They forged an alliance with Britain and the giant of the east, Russia. Napoleon struck back with his Grande Armée. He crushed the Austrians with ease. Then Napoleon tackled the giant. He found the Russian army camped with Austrian forces near the town of Austerlitz. Napoleon spends about a week before the battle going around the area, uh, reconnoitering it, making sure he knows what's going on. He has about 100,000 troops gathered around this battlefield of Austerlitz. Napoleon opened with a bluff. Pretending to retreat, he lured the enemy into treacherous ground, a battlefield surrounded by hidden French troops. Leading the Russians into battle was Tsar Alexander. But Alexander was a novice on the battlefield and no match for the military mastermind of the era. The men around the Tsar Alexander, including the Tsar Alexander, were young hotheads. And they were convinced that the French were vulnerable, um, and so they attacked. Alexander marched his army straight into Napoleon's trap. The French troops slaughtered thousands of Russians. Tsar Alexander barely escaped with his life. At Austerlitz, French forces wiped out a third of the Russian army. And one man emerged as the military master of Europe, the Emperor Napoleon. Austerlitz shows Napoleon at his strategic best as an intuitive general sensing what the terrain calls for and how the psychology of the enemy can be best exploited to use that to fight them against themselves. Napoleon's triumph demonstrated his perfection of the art of war. And the Bonaparte hype machine made the most of it. The other greatness of Napoleon is after the battle, writing it up, telling the story of the battle uh, in such a way as to make it look as though he had been a grand strategist who planned this very battle six months before. What in effect was a game of poker, he made out to be a round of chess. 
Nine years later, Napoleon prepares to recapture the glory of Austerlitz. The coast of France looms on the horizon, but the former emperor doesn't know whether he'll be cheered on arrival or shot. After 10 months in exile, Napoleon once again plants his feet on French soil. Vindication or defeat, his fate lies ahead on the road to Paris. February 1815, only 10 months after being banished, the emperor is coming home. The prisoner of Elba has broken out of exile. Napoleon's invasion of France has begun. Napoleon doesn't know what his reception is going to be in France. He obviously has his supporters, but he doesn't know how much those who've gone over to the royal party will follow him. So it is a gamble. Napoleon lands at Golf Juan with secrecy on his side. But the emperor wants his comeback seen as a legitimate return to power, not a military coup. Well, one thing that Napoleon had to promise the French at this point was that he would not plunge them back into the kind of disastrous wars and that he would not reestablish the kind of repressive regime that he had um, presided over during the empire. So Napoleon promised that he would try to take back France without firing a shot. Napoleon's audacious march on Paris begins in the foothills of the Alps. Napoleon and his men move like the wind, 30 miles in 24 hours. They pass through Castellan, Dean. Still, no one rises up to stop him. This man has bled the French Empire dry. He has left the bones of men and boys to bleach on the sands of Egypt, on the steppes of Russia, in central Germany, in northern Italy, in Spain. He has brought his empire down with a resounding crash around him. How is it the French don't shoot him on sight? I suppose it's possible that had he landed in the wrong area, had he come across a military detachment that was loyal to the new government, he might very well have been shot. But he was lucky, as so many times throughout his career. He met with a population that, that hailed his return. Um, and then very quickly, the army did start going over to him. This was obviously the crucial thing. 500 miles away in Vienna, the Allies plot the future of France. Then they hear the stunning news. Bonaparte has escaped. When the Allies meeting in Vienna hear that Napoleon has left Elba and is going back through France and is attracting support, they describe him as a general outlaw. And so he is someone who has to be stopped. No one in Vienna feels the heat more than Charles Talleyrand. He has sold out Napoleon to win clout in the new French regime. Then comes word that his old partner is back in business. Talleyrand's schemes are about to be smashed to bits. Talleyrand began making sure that he could control uh, the internal affairs of France during whatever period Napoleon would be there. The great leaders of Europe mobilize to retaliate. One advantage for the Allies is a hostage they hold in Vienna. The one thing Napoleon wants most, his three-year-old son. At the height of his imperial power, Napoleon Bonaparte had it all. An empire, an adoring populace, and an empress at his side. But to build a dynasty, one thing was still missing. A son. Besides wanting to be emperor, to solidify that position among the rulers of Europe, he also needed an heir 
to solidify the dynasty. Josephine was barren. And so he needed to look for someone who could bear him that child. Although he still clearly had great feelings for Josephine, that desire for an heir came before everything else. Napoleon reluctantly told Josephine he needed to divorce her. The divorce was a reason of state, and um, I think Napoleon did it with a good deal of personal sadness, but without hesitation. For Napoleon, the quest for an heir was a matter of state, not the heart. When he was shown a portrait of the Austrian emperor's daughter, Marie Louise, he declared, that's just the kind of womb I want to marry. For Napoleon, marrying her would serve two obvious purposes. First, she was young and she was probably fertile. And secondly, uh, this would, he thought, finally truly legitimize him in the eyes of the crowned heads of Europe. For an interloper to marry into perhaps the oldest reigning family in Europe was no small accomplishment. In April, Napoleon made Marie Louise his empress. Within a year, she delivered. A hundred rounds of cannon fire rang out across Paris, announcing the birth of Napoleon Francois, heir to the Bonaparte dynasty. The birth of Napoleon's son was one of the great events in his life. He felt finally that the continuity of the empire had been assured and that his name would live forever as the founder of a new dynasty of French monarchs. During Napoleon's exile, Marie-Louise fled to Vienna with their child. The father of the would-be dynasty was denied any contact with his son. One year later, Napoleon is back to reclaim his throne and an empire for his heir. But first, he must once again win the hearts of the French people. On the long road to Paris, the emperor's charm begins to work its magic. The march to Paris is one continuous set of good news, and at almost no point along the way does anything go against him. He's either able to avoid hostile areas, or he simply is able to win the soldiers over to him, and more and more, this becomes legendary as it's happening. In the town of Gap, a few old officers join the crusade. The next morning, cheering crowds trail the troops for six miles. Napoleon's comeback is gathering strength. In Paris, a letter arrives for Louis XVIII. The message, Napoleon is on his way to Paris. The king cries out, it is revolution once more. His house folded like a house of cards. Just one after another, everything fell apart. Louis still really didn't even know what to do. In desperation, King Louis officially declares Napoleon a traitor. It's now every loyal French soldier's duty to kill Bonaparte on sight. March 7th. As Napoleon arrives in Le Frey, his troops find themselves staring down the muskets of the king's men. Napoleon orders his soldiers to lower their guns. Determined not to fire a shot, the emperor slowly walks forward. Soldiers of the fifth, I am your emperor. Know me. If there is one among you who would kill his emperor, his general, here I stand. The king's men drop their guns. Shouting, long live the emperor, they rush to embrace Napoleon. This power of character somehow makes the, the troops that were opposing him join him and continue this extraordinary flight of the eagle, as it's called, when he comes up from the south of France to Paris. It's hard to say whether Napoleon still had a real spell over France at this time, but he had a spell over the army. He was the person who had brought them, yes, to terrible defeat, but he had also brought them to glory. He had inspired incredible loyalty in the French army, and this great gesture of, the, of coming back to France, of defying the Allies, of landing, simply inspired people in a way that hardly anything has ever inspired people in history. And they followed him. <laughs> 
it was really a good indication to Napoleon that his personal charisma was still there. And from then on out, he was building an army and that whole spirit, yes, we can have it back. Yes, we can be great again. Here he is to lead us on. It was there. The pride of France, Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte is back. Napoleon Bonaparte has broken out of exile and won back the countryside. After three weeks marching north through France, the deposed emperor is just hours from Paris. But not everyone is thrilled by Napoleon's miraculous resurrection. Members of the king's court flee the capital in fear. The hysteria reaches the palace the king's attendants urge him to run for his life. After all, his own brother, Louis XVI, lost his head to the revolution. The king cuts his reign short and makes a quick exit. Napoleon's return to France was not a great moment for Louis XVIII. He promised very grandiloquently to die before being forced to flee France again. And then with Napoleon approaching Paris, he fled France again. On March 20th, cheering crowds carry the emperor into the Tuileries Palace. His comeback is a triumph. In just 20 days, he has reclaimed his crown and country, true to his word, without firing a single shot. But the final piece of the imperial puzzle is missing his son and heir. The Austrian emperor forbids any reunion between Napoleon and his son. For the Allies, not letting Marie Louise and Napoleon's son go back was a clear sign that they considered his return utterly illegitimate. It would have caused great problems for the Allies had the Austrian emperor's daughter been there back in France as empress. It would have seemed to give legitimacy back to Napoleon and his empire. They weren't going to let this happen. The emperor isn't the only one missing a son. After nearly 20 years of Napoleon's bloody wars, hardly a family in France hasn't sacrificed a son to conscription, the draft. Conscription was probably the one single thing that people hated the most about his regime. It took young men um, away from their families and sent them off for years where they'd have hardly any contact with their family. Back then, if you went into the army, there was a very great chance that you'd die of disease before you even met the enemy. To feed Napoleon's war machine, France has already sacrificed more than 900,000 sons. The nation refuses to do it again. Government ministers surprise the emperor with the additional act, a law that reigns in Napoleon's powers and restricts conscription. That additional act meant that Napoleon wasn't going to be restored to the empire that he thought, not to the kind of constitution he had. He had a problem. Without the draft, Napoleon is powerless against his enemies. Meanwhile, the Allies gather in Vienna and plot to eliminate him permanently. And no one in Vienna shares more history or hatred of Napoleon than Alexander Romanov, the Tsar of Russia. 1807. After humiliating Alexander at Austerlitz, Napoleon poured salt in the wound. In a string of ferocious battles, he drove the Russians back to their borders. carnage brought the Russian Tsar to the bargaining table. In a tent on a raft in the middle of the Niemen River, Tsar Alexander I and Napoleon Bonaparte met face to face for the first time. Je suis enchanté d'enfin me rencontrer Alexandre. Je suis très très d'accord. And something unexpected happened. Napoleon was charmed. His first remarks to Napoleon when they meet in this raft is, 
I hate the English as much as you do. And then Napoleon replies, well, if that's the case, I think we can do business. Napoleon was ready to embrace Alexander. He was ready to almost fall in love with him. And he did. He wrote back to Josephine saying, if Alexander was a woman, I'd marry him. Alexander is very romantic about his vision of Napoleon. And he, as it were, falls in love with Napoleon. He falls under the spell of Napoleon. What's clear is that the two of them seduced each other. For once, somebody did a number on Napoleon. The leaders signed the Treaty of Tilsit, effectively blockading trade between Europe and France's arch enemy, Britain. They talked about how they would divide Europe, where they would draw the boundary line. This belonged to Napoleon, this belonged to Alexander, where Alexander could expand south of Russia, Napoleon could continue the control of Western Europe. The two rulers parted, with Napoleon believing he had dealt the British a death blow. But before the afterglow of their summit had time to dim, Napoleon discovered that Russia was secretly trading with Britain. Alexander had betrayed him. The Russian economy was in desperate straits, and Alexander needed to trade with Britain and needed to trade outside of, outside of Europe. And so he gave in eventually, and Napoleon was crushed. Napoleon was furious at Alexander's infidelity. It was proof that he could trust no one. If he was to rule Europe, he would have to do it alone. Spring, 1815. Russia and the rest of Europe are again uniting against him. The resurrected emperor must fight. But after his breathtaking march back to power, Napoleon believes nothing is impossible. Russia, Prussia, England, Austria. Let them all conspire to crush him. He can build a new war machine to recapture his glory, whether his people like it or not. The emperor is back and ready to take on the world. Napoleon Bonaparte has reclaimed his imperial crown. He's defied the other nations of Europe and begun a 100-day quest to rebuild his empire. The French people have again given him their hearts, but not the dictatorial powers he once enjoyed. New legislation strips the emperor's right to draft an army. But laws have never stopped Napoleon before. He knows the Allies are pooling their forces to take him out for good. And even Napoleon can't win a war without soldiers. I've often thought of the Hundred Days as a kind of a suicide pact between Napoleon and his people. There was a hopeless love that united the French. The French understood that war was inevitable. Napoleon launches what France had feared, a massive forced rearmament converts warehouses to musket factories, ordering 240,000 guns. In makeshift sweatshops, uniforms are quickly sewn. In six back-breaking weeks, Napoleon makes the French gear up for another war they don't want, to defend an emperor under attack from all sides. The Herculean effort is haunted by bitter memories of Napoleon's last crusade. The quest that doomed his empire and threw his people into despair. The Russian campaign, only three years before. June 1812. At the height of Napoleon's power, his one-time friend, Tsar Alexander of Russia, had double-crossed him. To punish the Tsar for secretly trading with Great Britain, Napoleon staked everything to invade Russia. What he wanted to do is he wanted to teach Russia a lesson and essentially to humiliate it, to knock it out of the war. He wanted to crush its army. Napoleon drafted men from every corner of his empire, from Poland to Italy, and put together one of the largest armies ever seen in Europe, a fighting force 
of 600,000 men. The Russian campaign was, without question, the greatest campaign in European military history to that point, and it required all the resources of the Grand Empire to bring it off. Napoleon believed he could do almost anything. You have to remember that. He could move his troops at lightning speed. He could live off the land. He could do all of that. So they would go to Moscow. They would have one great pitched battle. Alexander would capitulate. He would be told his lesson. Napoleon could then control Europe as he pleased. It didn't happen that way. As the troops marched deeper into the vast Russian wilderness, Tsar Alexander unleashed a few surprises of his own. Knowing that Napoleon's men survived by living off the land, Alexander dealt the French a death blow. He scorched the Russian earth, obliterating any hope of foraging for food. The farther the French penetrated, the more the Russians were forced to do that. And then they drew Napoleon and his men farther and farther and farther into Russia. Hunger and fatigue devastated Napoleon's men. Over 10,000 horses died, slowing movement to a crawl. They suffered enormously. For a while, the road there, as dysentery struck, became the longest and foulest open latrine in human history, and the soldiers just died of dysentery. After two months hard marching, Napoleon's Grande Armée caught up with Alexander's men 70 miles from Moscow, near a town called Borodino. Twelve hours of combat, non-stop slaughter. The French killed 40,000 Russians. Still, Tsar Alexander wasn't about to surrender. Napoleon and his troops headed triumphantly into Moscow, eager to plunder the city for food and supplies. On September 14th, the Grande Armée took control of a ghost town. But rather than let Napoleon's men ravage his capital, Alexander did it himself. He burned the ancient wooden city of Moscow to the ground. Firestorm left little food, few supplies, and winter was approaching fast. He thinks that once I've got the capital city, I should have the control of Russia. But he doesn't. He, and he doesn't understand why that's the case. Russia is, in fact, this giant sort of, uh, it's not a centralized situation. It's lots of little centers. And so taking the capital city makes no difference whatsoever. Napoleon set up camp in the Kremlin. For weeks, he ignored the warnings of his officers that the time had come to head back to France. It's always been a bit of a mystery to me why Napoleon hung on for as long as he did in Moscow. Uh, he certainly underestimated the difficulty of marching out in the winter. Five weeks passed. Finally, Napoleon ordered the retreat, 1,500 miles back to Paris. They started to march out of Moscow, and very quickly they ran into the Russian winter. They had never seen anything like this before. Coming out of Moscow, I think one of the most horrifying scenes is what was left of the Battle of Borodino, which had led the way into Moscow. It had never been cleared. There were half-eaten skeletons lying on this sloping hill. Fierce blizzards splintered Napoleon's army. Packs of Cossacks flew in through the snows on horseback and picked off the French one by one. Thousands starved or froze to death. Some even turned to cannibalism to survive. Winter came in worse and worse. And this is 500 miles into Russia. At 20 miles a day, it's long, it's painful, it's cold, it's dark. The army suffered unimaginably. There are stories of people simply falling in the snow and being covered by the snow. There are stories of horses that were so cold that 
the desperate soldiers would be slicing chunks of flesh off the horses and just eating them raw and that the horses wouldn't even notice because they were completely numb from the cold. It was one of the great disasters in history. He had marched into Russia with over a half a million men. Barely 25,000 staggered out. Back in Paris, Napoleon confronted a nation disillusioned by his disastrous Russian campaign. Prussia and Austria were planning an invasion of France, and the French people had little resistance left. Within a year and a half, the Allies marched into Paris, commanded by the man Napoleon had hoped to humiliate, Tsar Alexander. The emperor was forced to give up his throne and was shipped off to exile on Elba. In the spring of 1814, Napoleon's reign was over. Barely one year later, the emperor has struck back. He's marched over 500 miles, retaken the capital, and rearmed his nation. Napoleon is reviving his war machine to defend his comeback. Not even the Russian nightmare has humbled him. The emperor is taking France to war one more time. June 12th. 1815. In just 10 weeks, Napoleon Bonaparte has drummed up an army of over 100,000 men. Now he is leading them into a final confrontation. A decisive battle against the Allied armies will restore France's glory and convince the world that the French Emperor is here to stay. But the rest of Europe won't stand for it. Leading the charge to defeat Napoleon is France's arch enemy, Great Britain. And taking command of the Allied forces is a British general, the Duke of Wellington. The Duke of Wellington was Britain's greatest general in this time. Incredibly efficient, competent. He liked to fight wars of maneuver. He was not somebody who insisted on fighting the grand climactic battle the way Napoleon did. In this sense, he was really very much Napoleon's opposite as a general. The British were fortunate in Wellington in having a man of similar intelligence to Napoleon, but a very different disposition. Wellington was very good at watching his enemy and at understanding what was giving the French their success, and then, to some degree, using it against them. Since Napoleon's escape, nearly every country in Europe has joined the crusade to crush the outlaw emperor. From across the continent, they send troops to Wellington's army. All of Europe eagerly awaits the coming showdown. Russians, Austrians, Dutch, and Germans all gather in Brussels and join the British to celebrate the impending defeat of the tyrant Bonaparte. The Allied commander is confident that with the Prussians on his side, they can take Napoleon down once and for all. The Allies massed their troops across the border in Belgium. On June 15th, Napoleon marches his men right at them. The Emperor declares the time has come to conquer or die. He commands a force of over 120,000 men. But he's about to tackle two armies, the Allies under Wellington and the Prussians, with twice as many soldiers. In the face of such odds, Napoleon's first challenge is to keep his troops motivated. The spell that Napoleon had over the army, particularly over the guard, continued in 100 days. And he was able to raise an army not as large as he wanted, but impressively large nonetheless, and march it into Belgium, where he hoped that he could confront the Allies and beat them decisively. And this is what he promised the soldiers, that they would go, they would have a short campaign and win, and France would be restored to its glory. As his first move, 
Napoleon takes the Belgian town of Charleroi, step one of his strategy to drive a wedge between Wellington's troops and the Prussians, dividing their strength. To tackle the two armies, Napoleon appoints two seasoned commanders, Michel Ney and Emmanuel Grouchy. Grouchy will help Napoleon take on the Prussians, while Marshal Ney will lead the cavalry against Wellington's forces. On the eve of the battle, Wellington attends a lavish ball for the Allies in Brussels. With Napoleon's forces nearly two days away, Wellington is the picture of calm. But after midnight, the message arrives from the front. Napoleon's troops are less than 24 hours from Brussels. Wellington at Lady Richmond's ball was surprised not by the fact that Napoleon was going to attack them in Belgium, they expected that, but again, the speed at which he arrived on their front door. The Allied commander keeps his cool then politely takes his leave. Wellington's plan had been to head off the French at the nearby town of Quatre Bras. Once again, Napoleon has beaten the Allies to the punch. Wellington supposedly remarks, he's humbugged me by God, and immediately leaves the ball and starts organizing his army to go fight. Wellington surveys the map for a better spot for the battle. We must fight him here. Time, terrain, and tactics all point to the fields south of Brussels and a village called Waterloo. June 16, 1815. The fate of Europe, France, and the modern world's greatest warrior meet at a crossroads in Belgium, Waterloo. For Napoleon Bonaparte to survive, he must win the battle of his life, 120,000 troops against an enemy nearly twice the size, the combined armies of Prussia and Britain. Napoleon has beaten the odds before, but now he seems a haunted man. He hesitates, slow to issue commands, but the war won't wait. Napoleon's right-hand man, Marshal Ney, opens the assault. 4,000 French cavalrymen draw their sabers and charge. But Ney orders the attack too late, giving Wellington's infantry time to form an unbeatable defense, impenetrable square formations. The way you beat the cavalry is you formed your soldiers into a square, bristling with muskets, firing out a uh, phalanx of a sort. And it was very difficult for cavalry to come up against a square like that. The horses would not charge into a square. They would draw up, and then they'd be vulnerable. Wellington waits until the French are within 30 yards and gives the command. Today's horsemen fall like broken toys. The charge by Ney is not supported by the infantry or artillery fire. So they just smash up against the squares, these squares, the famous squares of Waterloo. Ney's cavalry takes such a battering that they have to retreat. Ney's attack is a disaster. But the bad news fails to reach Napoleon. At Ligny, he orders his Imperial Guards to attack the Prussians on his right. His finest troops launch into the enemy, obliterating whole regiments. As the Prussians fall back, Napoleon sends Marshal Grouchy to finish them off. Napoleon has no idea of Ney's crushing defeat, and he's convinced both Wellington and the Prussians are on the run. Victory appears almost in reach. June 18th, morning on the battlefield. Napoleon is exhausted. He spent the night 
having his hemorrhoids treated with leeches. The constant years of war had taken a real toll on Napoleon. By the end of his empire, he had gotten fat. He suffered terribly from this condition called dysuria that made it incredibly painful to urinate. He suffered from terrible hemorrhoids. He suffered from insomnia. Um, all of these things were plaguing him to one extent or another during the final campaign. Fighting pain and doubt, he tries to fire up his exhausted generals. I tell you now that Wellington is a bad general that the English are bad soldiers, and that the whole thing will be a picnic. His officers aren't so optimistic. One says the British troops are impregnable, famous for their tenacity and marksmanship. Another warns Napoleon, the English infantry in close combat is the very devil. But Napoleon won't stand for pessimism. Gentlemen, if my orders are carried out well, tonight we shall sleep in Brussels. 1 p.m. In the distance, Napoleon sees a mass of troops approaching. Finally, Marshal Grouchy has returned with reinforcements. Victory is at hand. It was the key moment of the battle when Napoleon saw a mass of troops approaching the battlefield and his heart leapt because he thought this was Grouchy coming back. Um, and bringing him the troops he needed. But closer inspection confirms his worst fears. They're not French soldiers, they're Prussians. There were 35,000 Prussians on Napoleon's right wing, so he was already being enveloped on the right wing as early as two o'clock in the afternoon. So clearly a very critical situation. At four o'clock, the Prussians tear into Napoleon's right flank. By seven, Prussian and British troops are closing in on both sides. Napoleon's last hope lies in his loyal Imperial Guard. The Imperial Guard are of the elite corps. They are the creme de la creme. They started off as Napoleon's bodyguard, gradually grew and grew and grew until it became a corps in its own right. This is his personal private army. Napoleon rallies his most loyal troops with a lie. He tells them Grouchy has returned with 30,000 more troops. The numbers are on their side. Their spirits lifted, the Emperor's faithful Imperial Guard charge forward. Napoleon's last-ditch effort to save his empire hangs on the strength of his finest troops. They've saved the day before. If they fail now, Emperor and his empire will be crushed forever. Waterloo, June 18, 1815. Time and again, Napoleon Bonaparte has outfoxed the armies of Europe. Today, his men are outmanned and outgunned. British and Prussian regiments surround the French. But Napoleon has fired up his Imperial Guard with a lie that more troops are on the way. Flush with confidence, the Guard march forward. At their Emperor's command, they advance uphill in a slow formation, smack into the sights of the British guns. It's hard to say whether Napoleon was at the top of his game at Waterloo. Probably not. There are endless debates among military specialists about whether he was still the genius he was. Certainly, he didn't perform as well as he had at the Battle of Austerlitz. The Imperial Guard marches headlong at Wellington's front line. Wellington waits until the French are within 50 paces, then gives the command. In less than 60 seconds, hundreds of French soldiers are mowed down. British cavalry fly over the hill and strike the final death blow. 
Napoleon tries to rush into the fray. His men hold him back, saying the enemy has been fortunate enough. The last gasp of the Imperial Guard happens when Napoleon throws them against the British. They do something which for almost all the French army was absolutely unheard of, which is they turn back. There was the famous statement that the guard never retreats, it dies. But uh, on this occasion, they retreated. The French forces break into full frenzied retreat. A few guardsmen hold out long enough to cover the retreat of the emperor himself. Napoleon's comeback is over. Waterloo, he was outnumbered. There were, in theory, 200,000 Allied troops nearby, and he only had about 80,000. I think the French probably performed as well as they could have done on that day. June 19, 1815. Napoleon's last campaign to terrorize Europe has terrorized no one more than his own people. In just two days, 25,000 French soldiers are slaughtered. Even as he slinks home in disgrace, Napoleon refuses to accept defeat. Napoleon didn't give up. He rode his brother and said, Joseph, we can get more horses to full cannon. I can get some more men together. This is just a skirmish. Carnage all over the battlefield. Incredible death. Napoleon fantasizes new campaigns. But now, hardly anyone in France will support his madness. June 22nd, the Prussians are closing in on Paris. At his palace, Napoleon receives the Allies' formal demand for his abdication. He erupts in a tirade and raves about reviving the terrors of the revolution to save his reign. But his delusion finally comes to an end. It is too great a price to pay for one man's life. I did not return from Elba to drench Paris in blood. After barely a hundred days in power, and only four days after his defeat at Waterloo, Napoleon gives up his empire for the second time. As the Allied armies flood into France, Napoleon flees to Malmaison, the retreat he once shared with Josephine. June 29th, a message arrives that the Prussians are poised to storm Paris. Napoleon must flee or face capture. Instead, he explodes in a final outburst. France ought not to meet to a handful of Prussians. He rushes up to his bedroom and emerges dressed in the uniform of the Imperial Guard. All is not lost. He pledges a new crusade to crush the enemies at the gates of Paris. After the Battle of Waterloo, with hindsight, it looks pretty clear that this was the end of the road for Napoleon Bonaparte. He really had no cards to play with at this point. And so finally, he dressed this up as doing it for France, that he was doing it for the good of his people who wouldn't be subjected to more war. But really, he didn't have much choice. He had to give up. The Allied armies march into Paris, and Louis XVIII returns to the throne. Barely one year earlier, a British frigate transported Napoleon to Elba. Now another British warship carries him away from France and out of Europe forever. The fury of Napoleon's 100 days taught the Allies a bitter lesson about exile. This time, they take no chances. The man who had dominated an entire continent will live out his final days on a speck of rock 1,200 miles from the African coast, the remote island of St. Helena. 17 years of warfare, six million people dead. Views on Napoleon's legacy are as sharply divided as the Europe he left behind. When one looks at the legacy of Napoleon, one can take the military side, which says France ended up with less than what she had begun with. But during the wars, there was glory. There was a period when Napoleon could have negotiated with Britain, and they probably would have let him keep what he'd got. 
but like the gambler who has to keep going, he couldn't stop. What he wanted was not just a peace, but a glorious peace. From Corsica to the crown, from exile in Elba to the apocalypse of Waterloo, his greatest gamble was his ill-fated imperial comeback. In just four months, he escaped from Elba, marshaled an army, and challenged all of Europe. His hundred days of power culminated in an epic final battle. One man's will versus an entire continent. The hundred days, the return from Elba in the annals of adventure remains one of the most unusual episodes in human history. Napoleon himself, when he was in exile in St. Helena, famously remarked, what a novel my life has been. People could hardly believe that a single man had done this. It really seemed like something out of the most fantastic sort of fiction. May 5th, 1821. At 51 years of age, Napoleon Bonaparte dies. The Corsican upstart who shook the world enters the realm of history. Napoleon's life seems to be what you can do if you try hard enough. So that's the enduring fascination for people, is that somehow he's, he's an image of success. And also this tragic destiny. A life written in blood. Conqueror, emperor, prisoner, Napoleon Bonaparte.